Lillian Moore's letter home from Alaska. Dear Lou, my trip into the interior was taken with Captain Abercrombie. We started August 5th with 24 wild horses, each carrying from 200 to 400 pounds. It had been raining for 41 days and was still raining when we started. About five miles from Valdez to the foot of the glacier was over rocks and creeks. First one horse would get away and then another. We had quite an excitement as they did not take kindly to the pack. Lillian's first-person account of ascending the Valdez Glacier en route to Copper River country where gold is said to abound is told by a prospector, horsewoman, and adventurer living and working in Valdez, Alaska in 1898. Written letters like those penned by Moore are conveyed via the mail, then kept. They form part of the historical record and communicate the history of the Alaska Territory to the outside world. They help the reader understand how the frontier town of Valdez was established and the importance of the mail in making it a transportation hub and gateway to the interior early in its history. Lillian writes, at the time, the fog was so thick we could not see 10 feet ahead. We had two guides with us who kept getting lost. We had to travel 10 miles to make two, back and forth. It is about 30 miles from timber to timber on an airline. There is an upgrade of 3,400 feet to the top of the Valdez Glacier. Well, we traveled all day, making rest now. You know, after you get up on the glacier, you can see nothing but great fields of ice for miles and miles and cold. Fellow 1898 prospector Basil Austin wrote daily in his diary of his trek up the Valdez Glacier. His two journals form another part of the written historical record. He notes on the inside cover of his logbook that the Atna Chief Nikolai, a Copper River native, provided information in July of 98 that inspired the creation of hand-drawn maps that likely aided Austin and his colleagues as they navigated the unfamiliar Alaskan terrain. Explorers and prospectors, those coming to develop and colonize the region and extract its natural resources, acknowledged the help provided by the Atna people. Roadside signs present today along the Richardson Highway extol the role of Alaska Natives during the gold rush. Prospector Joseph Bork, who hailed from Brooklyn, New York, kept a diary too and photographed the arduous journey to the interior. He is shown by the fireside laughing, then reading a letter received in the mail. Ships arriving from Seattle and dropping anchor in the deep Valdez Harbor brought the mail with them and news from the outside in 1898. A mail tent can be seen pitched in high snows along the Valdez Trail. Lillian Moore's letter was conveyed home to Hudson, Massachusetts, and her sister Lucy Gleason Moore via the mail, then transcribed by her cousin George Knight, who in turn sent a copy to his father, who was prospecting near Rampart City in Alaska. In her letter home, Lillian recounts descending the Valdez Glacier, fording the Clutina River. The horses forded the river three times, but some of the men took the mountain trail, and such a trail. We had to scale around the loose rocks over the river. If you missed your footing into the river, you would go. One man lost his balance, fell in the current, and was carried about 300 feet before he could catch himself. I sat down and waited until he came up. I thought he was drowned, but I did laugh when he reappeared. Finally, he shook himself like a rat and went in again after his hat. I went to 12 Mile Camp and found some friends who came up in the boat with me. They were going to take a load down to the sawmill that day, so said if I wished to ride, I could. That saved me a long 12-mile walk. 
but what a boat ride. The current runs about 50 miles an hour. The river is narrow and crooked, full of sandbars and snags and only two or three feet deep. It is the same river where so many lose their goods and are drowned. There is only one chance in a hundred of your getting down without getting wet or being stuck on a sandbar. It is full of little whirlpools and rapids, and when you strike one of those, the boat whirls around like a top. I laid flat on my back on top of the goods and held on to the sides. We got along all right until we struck a tree in the middle of the channel, which hit her broadside. She tipped a little, and the water ran over me about two feet. All you could see of me was my feet sticking out. It lasted only a second when she righted and went on as if nothing had happened. I was wet through and was cold and thought it would take my breath away. For a wonder, the sun was shining and was warm, so when we reached the sawmill, I was pretty well dried out. Others were learning about Lillian Moore's adventure in Alaska. In the May 1906 issue of the Western Home Journal, writer Sylvester Grog describes Miss Moore as tall, graceful, and willowy. He says that she started out from New York City with a band of 20 other women in 1898 to seek their fortunes in the Klondikes. The ranks were soon broken. Members dropped out until Miss Moore was the only one of the party that landed in the deep snow banks where is now located the prosperous little city of Valdez. An anonymous note references a newspaper article about Lillian Moore and says that she's connected with the government supply company, has made several perilous trips into the interior, and that she's learned the Indian language and has a position as court interpreter. Photographers from the period captured life in Valdez and Lillian Moore's rise and role in her community in the early part of the century. They picture the animal lover with her horses, dogs, and orphaned pet bears. Now an established businesswoman, Moore stands in front of the Copper River Drain Company, owned and operated by her and her husband, Edwin Wood. The town of Valdez, with Lillian Moore's aid and entrepreneurial spirit, would continue to grow and expand to a few thousand members. People and goods were transported from Valdez to Fairbanks, along the Valdez Fairbanks Trail, in sledges owned by the Ed S. Orr Company stage. They carried letters, too, not unlike Lillian Moore's, to family, friends, and businesses operating in interior Alaska. Newspapers conveyed the news of Moore's untimely death in 1916 noting that the adventurer died suddenly after suffering an apoplectic stroke at her home on McKinley Street. Her story doesn't end here, however, but concludes with her arrival back in Valdez after surmounting the Valdez Glacier in the fastest time of any woman on record. From her letter, We had five miles more to walk, When we started, I took the lead, found a good trail, and started at a fast pace. That coffee braced me up, and I felt good. The boys were saying that we could all go in together, only that they thought they would have to wait for me. I finished first, and the best of it was, when I came in camp, I got three cheers and lots of handshakes. I broke the record, and the first woman to make the trip in three days and three hours. Arriving in camp, I had a hot drink went home and changed my clothes for dry ones, got my mail, I found about 20 letters waiting for me, read them all, went gadding, then laid down but could not sleep, got up and went to the hotel for my dinner and to a concert in the evening. Aside from a little stiffness, I felt fine, not a bit tired, and up the next morning as if nothing had happened.'"